please uh, do grab a seat. It's great to um, be with you this evening. Uh, we weren't planning to be here. Um, we were, were planning to be here this morning. We managed to get that right. Um, uh, my wife, Joe and I were down for uh, the weekend visiting Natalie and Dave, and we were supposed to be back uh, in crew by now. Um, but Dave isn't well this evening, and so I have the privilege of coming to, to share some of uh, God's word with you this evening, uh, standing in for him. So it's great to be with you. Thanks for your welcome. And I look forward to, to what God is going to say to us. Um, Floss mentioned I'm from, I'm, I'm from up north. Um, uh, we live in a place called Crewe. Uh, we haven't been there long. We moved there in May. And um, back in September last year, I, I first became aware of the opportunity there and started to explore it. And one of the first things I had to do was find out where Crewe was. Um, if we were going to go there, I thought I at least ought to find out where it was. And we know that now, um, so, that's all, so that's all good. Some of you, I guess, are much more knowledgeable about these things uh, than I am. It's sort of a bit northwest of Birmingham and a bit southeast of Manchester, um, for those who don't know it. But this evening, we're going to continue a series that you've been looking at over the last few weeks, uh, looking at the uh, seven letters uh, that were written to uh, churches, and we find them in Revelation uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3. And uh, this evening, we're going to look at the sixth letter to a church in a place called Philadelphia. But just by way of uh, background, of context, if you're not uh, familiar with these uh, letters at all, then Jesus had appeared to one of his followers, uh, somebody called John, and he'd called on him to write to these seven uh, churches. Just a few words to each one that would speak into their, into their situation. So Jesus had appeared to him. And it was, a, it was a powerful, it was an amazing experience. Because years before, um, Jesus had uh, gone to a cross. He'd died um, to uh, deal with the problem of sin in the world, to make it possible for people like up, us who've messed up and damaged our relationship with God to be drawn back into relationship with him. Three days later, Jesus was restored to life. And then a few weeks after that, he went back, back up to heaven to be with his father. And now there's this powerful vision where he appears in his glory and in his authority. And he gives John something to say to other churches. And here... In this letter, as in the letters to the other churches, Jesus speaks of himself. He, he says something about himself which is relevant to their context and to their situation. And for us tonight, uh, nearly 2,000 years later, although we're in Chalfont St. Peter or wherever you happen to be uh, watching this um, online, we're not in Philadelphia, but those words of Jesus are still relevant to us to our situation, to what's going on in our lives, to what's happening in our churches, to what is happening in the world. And as we look at this passage, we're going to think really about three things. We're going to think about open doors. We're going to think about coping with the problems of life. And we're going to be thinking about a wonderful, glorious future to which we can look forward. So let's read um, this letter. Um, we find it in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 to 13, and hear what it has to say to us. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia writes, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, 
I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The first thing we see here is a, is a mini self-portrait of Jesus. He's saying something about his character and what he is able to do. He describes himself as holy, a word that's often ref- used to refer to God. So he's saying something about his identity, about who he is. He describes himself as being true or, or faithful, someone we can rely on, someone we can trust, somebody whose words are dependable. And so many people today, are looking for people to trust, people whose words we can rely on. And Jesus is saying, I am that person. Listen to what I have to say. You can depend on it. And he goes on uh, to speak about holding the keys of David. It's a a reference to David, the great king of uh, Israel. And he says, because I've got these keys, I can open things and no one can shut them. Or I can shut doors and no one can open them. We um, were, Dave was feeling better yesterday and we were doing an escape room in Reading. I don't know if you've done this sort of thing, but you get locked in a room and you need to find keys to get out. And um, we managed to find a few keys and we managed to get out, which is pretty good. Otherwise, this evening could be a challenge. Um, but, you know, keys sometimes are important. Sometimes we, we just can't get into a place. What Jesus is saying, I have a key, I can open a door, and once it is open, no one can shut it. And he's referring to an Old Testament passage, as, as Revelation so often does, in this case in Isaiah chapter 22, where if you look at it, you will see that God was speaking to his people who were disobeying him. He was particularly speaking to a ruler who wasn't ruling well and says, I'm going to get rid of you, and I'm going to replace you with somebody that I can trust. Somebody who has my authority, somebody who has my confidence, and I'm going to give him these keys. In the time of Isaiah, it was fulfilled in in a person called Eliakim, but here it's fulfilled so much more in Jesus. So he says, I have these keys, and I can open, and I can shut. But then, one thing I, I saw when I was looking at this this afternoon is, Jesus moves from the generic I can do something to the particular. I have done something. I have placed before you an open door. It's a bit like hearing the news that there's a hearing in the news that there's a billionaire who's looking for people who are struggling financially and he wants to help them. But then getting a letter in the post and saying that this billionaire has put fifty thousand pounds into your account. It moves from being something that is of general interest to something that actually changes your life. And Jesus says, I've done that for you. Not just that I can do it, but I've done it. And Jesus knows that they're being excluded from something in in the town. He says, I recognize that. I know that there are things you want to do that you can't do, but I'm giving you something bigger something more important. I'm providing you with direct access to God and no one will be able to deny you. And one of the the fascinating things about this particular letter, and it's true in general to to the letters to the churches, is so much of what is said here is then picked up in the rest of Uh, this book that we call Revelation. And we get a great example here of having an open door. If we went on to the next chapter, in chapter one, we, we find this. After this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. There is a door open into heaven. An opportunity For people on earth to see what was going on in God's throne room. To gain an insight into God's plans and purposes. To be encouraged by what is going to happen in the future. And Jesus opens that door for them. Their access is guaranteed and no one 
can stop them coming into to God's presence. In, in, in the town in which they were living, they were being denied access to the synagogue, a place where uh, people would come to meet together to worship. But Jesus is saying, I've got something much better for you. You have access into the presence of God himself. So Jesus has the ability to open doors, and he opens doors for the people at Philadelphia. And I wonder if there are people here this evening or, or watching online who who know things about Jesus, but haven't experienced the reality for themselves. It might not be doors, but it might be knowing that Jesus is someone of infinite love. You know that. You've heard that. But you haven't experienced that love for yourself. Maybe you know that Jesus came to save everyone in the world, but... You haven't experienced that salvation for yourself. Maybe you know that Jesus came to give abundant life. But you, you're trying to cope with life on your own and you're finding it too, too hard. And I was reminded of a, of a time on a Sunday morning service um, uh, some years ago now where I was just preparing for, for that service and a lady came in to the church building I'd never seen before. And I was just trying to have some, you know, General conversation with her. How are you? What are you doing? What's your name? What are your plans for the rest of the day after this service? To which her response was, I'm going to commit suicide. And in this bag, I've got all the tablets that I need to make it possible. For her, life had got too hard. She was going to give up. It's a long story. It didn't work out like that. But that was, she'd come to that point. And she needed to know that Jesus came to bring her abundant life. Maybe you've heard that Jesus came to give freedom to those who are oppressed and tied down. But you are still constrained by experiences in the past and your situation. And, and our opportunity this evening, just as it was for those people in Philadelphia is to move from knowing something about Jesus to experience the reality of that for ourselves. Whatever it might be that you need to experience of Jesus, please take time to do so this evening. We'll have an opportunity to, to do that uh, a bit later. But is there something that Jesus is saying to you? I want you to experience something of me. Maybe for the first time or maybe... Something you experienced years ago, but you need to experience it of him again. We have an opportunity to do that tonight. And then Jesus goes on. He, he recognizes the church had gone through and we're, we're going through difficult times. Uh, we believe that it was a relatively small church experiencing real pressure um, from the, the Jewish community in the town who, who saw themselves as worshipping God in the right way and these Christians worshipping uh, God in the wrong way and they were excluding them uh, from some of their uh, benefits. And Jesus says, well done for staying faithful. But it's going to get hard again. There are going to be future problems. And then he says, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial. Actually, we're not quite sure what Jesus does mean here. There's two different schools of thought. One that says, I'm going to keep you from it so that you're not going to go through it. And another, another school of thought that says, you are going to go through it, but I'm going to walk that journey with you. I'm going to protect you in the middle of that. And the actual language used can, can mean either. And we're not going to get into the depths of that question tonight, though that'd be fun. Um, but I just want to mention a couple of things that Jesus said to his followers just before he was going to, to the cross. One thing he said was, you're going to have trouble in the world. You find this in John chapter 16. And then John chapter 17, he's praying to his father for his, his followers. And he says this, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Whatever is actually meant by this promise in, in Revelation 3, our experience as followers of Jesus is that life can sometimes be hard. It can be difficult. What we have in the words of Jesus, both in John's Gospel and in Revelation, 
is, yes, that shouldn't be a surprise, but I am there for you. I am praying for, to my Father that he will keep you safe um, through that, and I will be with you. He commends them for the way in which they've been faithful. He calls on them to hold on. He doesn't call on them to take major new initiatives, to redouble their witness or service. He just calls on them to stand fast, to persevere, and that this will result in them being victorious. A few weeks ago, I had the privilege of being in Georgia, uh, where I was uh, teaching a group of Azerbaijani Christian leaders. Um, in the country they live, they are oppressed for their faith. They are persecuted because they follow Jesus. They need to hear these words of Jesus. So sometimes all you need to do is to hold on. And it was important and good to be able to share with them. But there are also important words of comfort to many churches in this country who just feel that things are too bad, things are too difficult, they can't cope. Maybe they got things wrong. Maybe they actually do, do need to conform to the society and the culture that presses in upon them. And sometimes it's true for us as individuals where we're just finding that things can be too hard. And Jesus may simply be wanting to say, hold on. Hold on to what you've got and allow me to be with you, to support you, to carry you through that. But even if that is our experience this evening, even if that is where we are and what we need to hear from Jesus tonight, let's, and let's, if so, let's be prepared to accept that and to receive that. But we also need to hear that that is not the end. That is not the future. That is not what God has prepared for us. And um, from verse 11 onwards, he goes on to say, things are going to be good. He says, I'm coming back. That's the first thing. There is a day when Jesus will return. He will establish his kingdom. He will take his people to be with him. And we will be with him forever. I am coming, says Jesus. And the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. The idea of strength, of stability, of permanence. Something that Incidentally, would have resonated with the people of Philadelphia because they lived in an area that was seismically active. They had frequent devastating earthquakes. And many of the citizens would have had opportunities where they'd had to run out of the town and to live in temporary accommodation and then go back and rebuild the buildings that had fallen. And so this idea of being able to stay permanently in a safe and secure place would have really spoken to them. And that's what Jesus is offering um, to them. And he says, I'm going to do, I'm going to do th three things for you. I'm actually going to write my name on you. Sounds a bit strange. We don't go around writing names on each other. Not normally. Unless we've got a broken arm and people are writing things on the cast. But it's saying, Jesus is saying, I want to welcome you into my identity to say that you are in relationship with me. And he says, I'm going to do this in three different ways. I'm going to write on you the name of, of God. I'm going to write on you the name of the city of God. And I'm going to write on you my new name. And the people of Philadelphia may not have fully understood what he was saying. But as later they read through the rest of this book that we now call Revelation, I think they'd have come across time after time after time something that said, that's what... Jesus meant. These names that speak about belonging to God, these names that speak about being a citizen in his kingdom, these names that speak about living in relationship with Jesus. In Revelation 7, we read about people having a seal placed on their foreheads, a symbol of being under God's protection. In Revelation 14, we find that this seal was the name of Jesus and the name of of his father. So this relationship with God, this relationship with Jesus, brings protection, brings safety, brings eternal security. And that it realized that that was something of what Jesus meant. 
And in um, chapter 19, we, we're presented with another glorious vision of Jesus. Where we read about three of his names. In verse 12, we're told that he has a name that is so secret that nobody knows what it is. Verse 13, we're told that his name is the word of God. Verse 16, we're told that his name is King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is the one who reveals God to us. Jesus is the one who speaks God's words to us. Jesus is God's word lived out among us. He is the one with ultimate power and authority. He is unique. He is so unique that he has a name that we will never know. However much we come to know Jesus, there is something, always something more. Something that will always be a mystery. And he promises to give us his name. So that we can be associated with him. We can live in God's truth. We can live under his authority. Confident that no one has power that is greater than his. And then towards the end of this amazing book in, in chapter 21, uh, we read about a holy city coming down out of Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, referred to as the New Jerusalem. So going back to, to what we find in, in, in chapter 3. And this city is described as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Speaking of God's people in a glorious future, being presented to Jesus as the purified people for whom he died. And we, if we have chosen to follow Jesus, bear that name as well. We are citizens of that kingdom. We will be part of that wonderful reality that will go on forever. And as they heard more and more of these things, the people at Philadelphia, I'm sure, would have been more and more encouraged at what Jesus was promising to do for them. To guarantee their access to God in heaven. To protect them. To come back for them. To make them strong and secure. To draw them into a deeper relationship with God and with himself. To make them a citizen of God's eternal kingdom. Yes, maybe all you need to do for now is to hold on. But there is so much more that I have planned for you. And at the end of that short letter to them, he calls on them to hear what is being said and to act upon it. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Which of these things do you need to hear this evening? Which of them do you need to respond to? Going back to what we were thinking about a few moments ago, are there things that you need to receive from Jesus for yourself? Not just to know that he is able to do them as an abstract idea for other people, but that he wants to do that for you tonight. Do you need encouragement to keep holding on, to keep keeping on as things are really difficult? Do you need to receive from Jesus for yourself and allow him to write his name on you with all the blessings and all the fullness that provides. Do you simply need to accept and rest in the reality of who Jesus is? What Jesus has done? What Jesus is doing? And what Jesus will do in your life? Let's take a few moments of quiet to reflect and to think about this, this letter, about what it says. And what it says to you tonight. What is it that Jesus is calling you to do in response to what you have heard?